Part 1. You will hear a conversation between a man and a woman discussing a train ticket. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 5. Listen carefully to the conversation and answer questions 1 to 5. Good morning. Welcome to Southern Trains. What can I do for you today? Good morning. Can I get train tickets here? Yes, you can. Good. I'd like to buy a season ticket, please. That's no problem. First of all, I'd like to take some personal information. Okay. So what is your full name? I'm Sandra Williams. That's S-A-N-D-R-A and then W-I-L-L-I-A-M-S. Thank you. And can I have your full address, including the postal code? It's 43 Andover Way. The town is Stanton, and the postal code is ST63ED. Thank you. Now I need your date of birth. It's the 8th of October, 1994. Have you had a season ticket with us before? No, this is the first time. That's fine. Now, your season ticket can be registered online. To set up an account, we send you an email with details of what to do. So, can I have your email address, please? I'm not that keen on giving out my email address. I get too much spam. I can understand that. I can assure you that we don't send you any other emails at all, and the address is kept confidential we are bound to that by law. I suppose that's okay. My address is sandra at primrose.com. Primrose is spelled P-R-I-M-R-O-S-E. And finally, I need a contact number for you. Is it okay if I just give you my cell number? Yes, that's fine. It's 0548249712. Thank you. That is all the personal information done then. Before the conversation continues, you have some time to look at questions 6 to 10. Now listen carefully and answer questions 6 to 10. Now I need some details about the season ticket. What journey do you need it for? I've just got a new job in Bexington and I've quit my old job in Petersfield. I was thinking of driving to the new job, but there's always too much traffic when you pass Amberton. I thought the train would therefore be better for the commute trip from here in Stanton. I think you're right to do that. Trains don't get held up by traffic jams. Do you want just that route? For a little more, I can get you a ticket for the whole region. I'm not sure yet. I'll see when you give me the actual prices. Of course. Now, the price also depends on the timings. Off-peak is much cheaper, of course. That's for leaving after 9.30 in the morning and for not returning between the hours of 4 and 6 in the afternoon. A saving money would be good, but I'll need a peak ticket. I'll need to keep normal work hours and also not be too late back home to look after the children when they get back from school. Another way to save would be to buy only a weekday season ticket and not travel on weekends. Would that be good for you? Let's think. I do have some family near my new job, but I don't think I'd travel too often by train at weekends there. I'd probably drive with the family. The weekday thing would be an excellent option for me. Okay, I'll make it that. Finally, would you like first class, second class, or variable class? What's the variable class? 
That is something for frequent travelers. Travelers get 12 individual journeys a calendar month in first class and the rest of the month in second class. That way you can treat yourself from time to time when you're tired or get some peace and quiet when the train is busy. I think I'll go for that. I hate it when there are too many noisy kids on a train. So, now for the prices. For a one-month ticket for your route, it is $198. If you go for the whole region, it will be $215. If you want a ticket for more than one month, it's the same price per month until you go for a ticket for six months or longer. Then there is a 20% discount, which would make it $158.40 per month for your route, or $172.40 for the whole region. I think I'll go for my route rather than the whole region, but I'll take a six-month ticket and get the discount. That's fine. It'll be one hundred and fifty-eight forty then. I've just put in all the information. Please wait for a couple of minutes for the computer to process the order. The ticket will then be printed out. Where would I go to catch my train here every morning? Is it still Platform 4? It used to be that one, but it's changed now to 7. When you come through the entrance, there are six platforms right in front of you. That's where Platform 4 is. To get to yours, go right as you come in, and you'll find it just beyond the wall on the right side of the station. Okay. That is the end of Part 1. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. Part two. You will hear a woman giving some people information about some hotel services. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. Now listen carefully to the information talk and answer questions 11 to 15. Hello everyone, my name is Anna. I'd like to welcome you all today to the Paradise Hotel, and I'll tell you now a little about the services we have on offer here. As you've probably noticed, the Paradise Hotel is built on a hill, and so its design reflects that. Our hotel is on seven levels, and I'd quickly like to explain what can be found on each level. The main entrance to the hotel and the reception is on level 3. You can find the concierge's desk there, and also our coffee bar with its great view over the hotel's swimming pools, beach, and sea. All our accommodation is on levels 4, 5, and 6. If your room is on level 4, then its number will start with a 4, for example 407, and if your room is on level 5, then its number will start with a 5, for example 523. The same goes for level 6. Level 7 gives access to the spa and treatment area. If you'd like to book a treatment there or just use some of the facilities, call it from the phone in your room or just go down and speak to the staff there. Level 7 also gives access to the swimming pools and beyond them the beach. Both the beach and the swimming pools have sun loungers where you can lie and enjoy the good weather. There are also snack kiosks and bars found around the pools and beach. Moving up from the reception level, level 2 is where all the hotel restaurants are. There are three to choose from. First, there is the chef's restaurant where you can eat breakfast, lunch, and dinner from the buffets provided. If you'd prefer to eat a la carte, the eastern restaurant does Asian specialties, 
such as Thai, Indian, and Chinese food, and the Ocean Restaurant specializes in seafood and fish. Again, places can be booked for the Eastern and Ocean Restaurants from your room phone, or you can book at reception on Level Three, or just go to the restaurant itself. Level One has our fitness area. This includes a fully equipped gym with weights and aerobic machinery in classrooms, where you can go for scheduled fitness classes such as aerobics, Pilates, yoga, or spinning. The schedules are all posted at the fitness area's reception and at the main hotel reception. You now have some time to look at questions sixteen to twenty. Now listen to the rest of the information talk and answer questions sixteen to twenty. Now I'd like to let you know about some of the things that are going on this week at the hotel. Today's Monday, and tonight we have an entertainment evening by the pool. The weather forecast is good, and you should enjoy our selection of dancers, singers, magician, and other acts. This will start at seven and go on until ten. Tomorrow we have a pub-style quiz, which will be held in the rooftop bar. You can access this if you go up to the gym and follow the stairs opposite where the lift opens. The quiz will start at eight in the evening and go on for around two hours. Please note that under eighteens will not be allowed in the bar. On Wednesday we have a karaoke night. This will start at seven and go on until nine. This will take place next to the pool, and you are invited to be brave, grab the microphone, and show everyone what you can do. To start the evening, the hotel manager has bravely volunteered to sing first with his favorite song. He hasn't told us what his song is yet. We have left Thursday evening free. Some people just like to be left alone to relax, and there is a traveling circus visiting the town, and this is only one kilometer away. Let us know if you'd like us to book you a taxi to and back from the circus if you'd like to go. Friday evening is our jazz night. We have a local jazz band who plays with us every week, and they are a firm favorite with all our guests. This takes place in the coffee bar lounge, and in order to see them, you need to book a table. We only have forty tables available, with five places at each. So make sure you book ahead so that you won't be disappointed. Booking a table costs thirty dollars, and bookings should be done at the reception, not the coffee bar. Saturday and Sunday are also left free. Though there will be some live music playing both evenings by the pool from seven until half past nine. Now I have posted the schedule of events on the entertainment's notice board, and it's also available on our hotel website. If you'd like to ask me any questions about anything, please do so at any time. I'm usually in my office, which is next to reception. If I'm not there, ask reception, and they'll page me. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You will hear four students discussing their geography project. First, you have some time to look at questions twenty-one to twenty-five. Now listen carefully and answer questions twenty-one to twenty-five. Hi, Alison. How are you? Hi, Tony. I'm good. Are the other two here yet? Not yet. 
Oh, here they are now. Hi, Greg. Hi, Sophie. Hi, Tony. Hi, Alison. Hi, guys. Are we late? Not at all. Well, let's get down to it right away. As you know, we're talking about our geography project today, and our task is to survey an area to see whether it would be suitable for a new supermarket. Alison, you told me yesterday that you had an idea of how to start. Yes. Well, the first thing is that we'll have to choose the actual site that we wish to survey. Once that's done, we'll need to do certain preparation work. So, does anyone have any idea of a suitable site to survey? Sophie, you're good at this. Thanks, Greg. I've got some ideas. There is a farmer's field on Castle Road, just after the road leaves town and goes over the bridge. That could be a good place. Another possible site I found was in the town centre at the old cigarette factory. Finally, there's a possible site at the airport. Here are some notes I made for everyone. How's that, Greg? Excellent. I like the one at the cigarette factory. That'll be great for people to go to without having to travel too far. I also think that the town council would provide grants to help develop that site, as it's been abandoned for a long time. That's true, Greg. But if you look at Sophie's notes, it says that the size of the site is limited. Not that many people will go on foot, and while there'll be enough room for the actual supermarket building, there'll be no room for a car park. That's a good point, Alison. The potential cost of the site will be a lot higher too, as it's in the town centre. It's just a project, though. We won't actually need to buy a site. No, but doing costs in the project will all be part of how we're assessed. We will need to look at all startup costs as well as income forecasts for the first ten years of operation. Okay, I see that it's important. I like the idea of the site by the river. It shouldn't be too expensive, and the site near the edge of the town would be good for people to get to. There's the town ring road that goes nearby the site as well. Yes. However, the problem I see with that site is that it's too close to the river. We've had years with lots of rain recently, and the river's been known to burst its banks. There would maybe have to be a great deal of protection building to be done. I suppose that would be something our survey would address. In fact, that might be something extra for us to explore that we wouldn't normally have the opportunity to study. It could work in our favour. And now the airport site? It seems there's nothing particularly challenging about that site. The land wouldn't be too expensive, and there's plenty of road access because of the people going to the airport. Actually, I heard airport sites can be quite expensive. Yes, and although there is plenty of road access, the airport is not actually that close to the town. It's not that convenient. You now have some time to look at questions twenty-six to thirty. Now listen to the rest of the discussion and answer questions twenty-six to thirty. So I think we all agree on the Castle Road site next to the river. So Sophie, what's next? We really need to decide who does what. There are a number of jobs to be done before we actually get to go to the field and survey it. If we can get everything done quickly, we can do the survey at the weekend. So what's the first thing? We need to get authorization from the farmer to be on his land. If we can't do that, there's no point in starting to gather any information. I can do that. I'll nip down to the town surveyor's office and find the name and address of the owner. I'll go straight away and talk to him or her. Thanks, Alison. Now, one of the important early things is to find out whether there are any other development plans scheduled for that specific area, or in any other area that would affect what we're planning. I can try and do that, but I'm not sure what the procedure is. It's easy, Greg. You just go down to the surveyor's office again and ask for all proposed plans for that postcode. I can text you the postcode later. Thanks, Tony. That's my job organised then. Now, when we start to survey the field, we'll need certain equipment. You asked about equipment, didn't you, Alison? I spoke to Professor Johnson yesterday, and we can borrow all the necessary equipment from the department. I'll check that all the equipment is free at the weekend. Good. Anything else? 
Yes, Professor Johnson also told me that we have to pay a £200 deposit for the equipment. I don't have that kind of money. I can pay the deposit as long as I get it back. My parents have just put some money in the bank from a job I did for the summer. I can get it from the bank when we need it. It should only be for two days, Tony. We can get everything done in that time. OK, I'll pay the deposit and pick up the equipment from the department. Don't get it just yet. We have to get the authorization to be on the land first. OK. So, if we can get all these jobs done over the next three days, we can meet again on Thursday. If all is OK, we could get the equipment on Friday and survey the field at the weekend. Good. Well, thanks everyone. I'd better be off. Bye. 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 That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You will hear part of a lecture on T. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Today's lecture is about a product that has become a social custom in many countries. Tea. Tea is first recorded as being drunk in China, with the first records of it dating from around 200 years BC. In fact, tea drinking certainly became established in China many centuries before it had even been heard of in the West. In the latter half of the 16th century, there are the first mentions of tea as a drink among Europeans. These are mostly from Portuguese, who were living in the East as traders and missionaries. Although some of these individuals may have brought back samples of tea to their native country, it was not the Portuguese who were the first to ship back tea as a commercial import. This was done by the Dutch, who in the last years of the 16th century began to encroach on Portuguese trading routes in the East. In the 17th century, the British took to tea with an enthusiasm that continues to the present day. It became a popular drink in coffee houses, which were as much locations for the transaction of business as they were for relaxation or pleasure. Coffee houses were thought to be the preserve of middle and upper class men, as women drank tea in their own homes, and then tea was still too expensive to be widespread among the working classes. In part, its high price was due to a punitive system of tax. The first tax on tea in the leaf, introduced in Britain in 1689, was so high at 25 pence per pound that it almost stopped sales. It was gradually reduced until as recently as 1964, when tea tax was finally abolished. British politicians were forever tinkering with the exact rate and method. During the 18th century, there was an equally furious argument about whether tea drinking was good or bad for the health. Wealthy philanthropists in particular worried that excessive tea drinking among the working classes would lead to weakness and melancholy. Typically, they were not concerned with the continuing popularity of tea among the wealthy classes, for whom strength for labour was of rather less importance. The debate rumbled on into the 19th century, but was really put to an end in the middle of that century, when a new generation of wealthy philanthropists realised the value of tea drinking to the temperance movement. In their enthusiasm to have the working classes go teetotal, tea was regularly offered at temperance meetings as a substitute for alcohol. You now have some time to look at questions.
Today, tea is a staggeringly popular drink all over the world. Although many people perceive the UK to be the biggest tea consumer, they only make up 6% of world tea consumption, which is the same as Russia. Japan, another traditional tea consumer, makes up 5%. Chinese consumption outstrips these countries with 16%, but India is the largest consumer with 23%. The rest of the tea consumption across the world is shared around the rest of the world. You now have some time to look at questions. Producing tea is a careful process. For optimum taste, the best quality teas are grown at tea gardens at an altitude of 5,000 to 7,000 feet above sea level. It begins with plucking, the removal of the right parts from the tea plant, Camellia sinensis. Pluckers are specially trained to only select two leaves and a bud. Plucking is maintained at about seven day intervals. The plucked leaves are collected in baskets, taking care that the leaves are not crushed by overloading. The leaves and buds then need to be withered. During the withering process, the leaf is induced to lose moisture to prepare it for further processing. Normally, this is carried out by spreading tea leaves thinly on troughs, through which warm air is circulated by fans. The average length of the withering time depends greatly on the quality of the leaf peculiar to the region where it has been grown. When satisfactory withering has taken place, the leaf is ready for rolling. This process uses grooved rollers that twist the leaves, break them up and take out the juices. Leaves pass through three to four such rollers, getting reduced in size and their cells broken up to enable fermentation. Normally, the tea ferments or oxidizes from 60 to 100 minutes, depending on the leaf quality. The character of the tea develops significantly during the fermentation process. The next part of the process is drying. The objective of drying is to arrest fermentation and remove any dampness from the tea. After completion of the drying process, the tea becomes fully black in color. The teas are then sorted, graded and packed. The tea is sold at auctions to traders who then employ tasters to decide how the teas should be blended to create the specific brands or retail requirements. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Yeah. <laughs>